to perform a few songs for us now, please welcome the cast of Spring Awakening. Awful sweet to be a little butterfly Just swinging over things and nothing deep inside Nothing going, going wild in you, you know You're slowing by the riverside Or floating high and blue Or maybe to be a little summer wind Like once through everything And then away again With a taste of dust in your mouth all day But no need to know Like sadness You just sail away Cause you know I don't do sad not even a little bit Just don't need it in my life Don't want any part of it I don't do sadness Hey, I've done my time Looking back on it all Then it blows my mind I don't do sadness So been there Don't do sadness Just don't care So maybe I should be some kind of laundry line Hang their things on me And I will swing um dry You just wave in the sun through the afternoon And then see They come to set you free Beneath the rising moon Cause you know Just don't need it in my life Don't want any part of it I don't do sadness Hey, I've done my time Looking back on it all Man, it blows my mind I don't do sadness So been there Don't do sadness Just don't care Listen to us in the heart of a 
child A song so big in one so small Soon you will hear where beauty lies You'll hear and you'll recall The sadness, the doubt, all the loss, the grief Will be long to some play from the past As the child leads the way into a dream of belief A time of hope through the land A summer's day Keep it going, one more time. Cool, so please go down the line and, and introduce yourselves and talk about what you do in the show and, and how you got involved. Hi. Redundant mic, we need it? Oh, okay, great. Um, hi, my name is Ali Stroker and I play the role of Anna in the revival of Spring Awakening and I became involved in this production a year and a half ago when I auditioned in California, in Los Angeles. Um, my name is Austin McKenzie, and I play the role of Melchior Gabor. Uh, I too joined a year ago um, when we did the show in Skid Row in Los Angeles, and um, I sent in an audition tape from Chicago and got cast from there. Hi, my name is Sandra May Frank, and I'm from Kentucky. So I also, well, I play the role of 
Venla. And so I also sent in a tape from Washington, D.C., where I was at the time. And uh, I didn't hear anything for about a month. And the next thing I knew, uh, I was out in California with a whole varied cast, with a whole bunch of people that came together. That was about a year ago. And here we are now. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Uh, my name is Katie Boak, and I am the voice of Vendla. So um, the show kind of functions in this cool way where uh, the deaf actors have voicing counterparts, some of which are also in the band. So um, I play guitar and kind of shadow her and follow her around as her, her voice. Um, I'm Alex Boniello. I am the voice of Moritz, which is played by Daniel. And I do basically the exact same thing as what she just said. I play guitar in the band. Um, shadow him about, voice for him. Whenever he's signing, I'll be speaking for the most part, and yeah. Hi, my name is Daniel, um, and I play the character of Moritz. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I myself am from Minnesota. Uh, I've been involved in the theater, was out in California, and now I'm happy to be here. Hi, I'm Robert Ariza. I'm one of the swings for the production of Spring Awakening, and I joined here in New York, actually. Wow, so, so this was put on, or I guess the revival came on through Deaf West. Um, so where did the idea even come from? Were, are any of you privy to, to how the idea even came about? Um, well, Michael Arden is our director, and um, I'm pretty sure that he and Andy, who is a honchin in our cast, um, had this brilliant idea to uh, do a production of this show, which centers on the themes of of the basically the breakdown in communication between parents and children, and how, especially when it comes to sex and you know educating children about that phase of life of adolescence, how at, at least in this time in the show, and even still today, how difficult it can be because it's uncomfortable, it's awkward, parents don't know how to talk to their children, so they had this amazing idea to um, revive it with Deaf West, casting some uh, two of the three main characters um, as uh, deaf characters actually within the show um, to just sort of amplify that theme of, of the difficulty in communicating. Um, so some of the characters in the show have uh, deaf parents, some of them have hearing parents, and so in many of the scene, theme, uh, scenes, that, uh, that idea of, of communication is uh, really amplified, and um, yeah, I don't know, maybe you can elaborate on that. Oh yeah, the Milan Conference. Okay, so the Milan Conference was a gathering that took place sometime in the 1880s, um, back then, the sign language, ASL, um, was readily available, but at this conference, they decided to come together to talk about communication, and they decided that they would no longer allow people to use ASL. Instead, they would have to use an oral means of communication. And that way, everybody would learn English and be able to communicate with everyone. And if you wouldn't be able to use your voice or speak, um, then you wouldn't make it through education. And so, that was happening at the time the original play was being written. So it's kind of interesting to look at the parallels about communication, and it fits really perfectly. I mean, even though it wasn't trying to, but there's a lot of parallels. Wow. So how did, how did the success of the show out there like, lead it to Broadway now? I mean, it seems like that that was, I don't, to me, the, is that a big leap, or is that kind of like the next step for what it was, for where it was out on the West Coast? Yeah, I think this has been a really special, unique situation um, you know we put up this show almost exactly a year um, our first show um, downtown Los Angeles um, was a year uh, to the day that we opened our first pre preview on Broadway and we did two different performances or productions in LA before we came to New York we did um, a production in a 99 seat theater and it was kind of like a black box setting. It was small, and uh, it was really a time for us to explore how we were going to tell this story. And then um, that went really well. We got extended. People, like, our, it was sold out. People were really, really excited. And then we did it at a bigger theater in um, Beverly Hills called the Wallace Annenberg Theater uh, this past spring. 
And there had been like a little bit of buzz of like, oh, maybe it'll move to New York. Maybe something will happen. And all of us were like, we're not getting our hopes up. We'll see what happens. And then a month later, we found out that we were going to be opening this fall on Broadway. Huh. And so here we are. So Robert, you said you joined in New York, right? But the rest of you were all part of the original cast, right? I joined at the second production. So I wasn't at the 99 seat thing. So I guess I kind of got to miss the... Uh, the hard, hard, hard part. And I, I kind of just hopped in and like lived my life in Beverly Hills with these guys. But yeah. right. the majority of the cast, though, is uh, is almost entirely from the original, you know, version that we did right. downtown. There's been, you know, some changes here and there. Some of the adults, a couple of the swings and um, voices and stuff like that. But almost everybody. So I, th I think yeah. all of you on stage right now. This is like everyone's Broadway debut, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. correct. So I just want to acknowledge that real quick because this is amazingly talented. The, the show is phenomenal and you guys, I would have never thought that, you know, that you had never been on Broadway before, but. Um, we fooled you. Ha ha. The magic of theater. Um, so the, on the surface, the show is about teenagers and, and discovering their sexuality. And have you found that that a lot of people um, come to the show with different expectations of what it's about? Because the friend of mine that I brought when I saw the show, she was like, oh, it's a tragedy. And I said, oh, yes, you just wait, right? Like, do you find that is, is common in the feedback that you get? Oh, I'm finding it because the first production of the show on Broadway was kind of recent. Um, some would say very recent. Um, you know, a lot of people have ideas of what this show is based off of that. And I think that when you come to see the show, you realize what we and our creative team and what Michael Arden and everybody decided to do with it is a complete reinvention of what the show is, right? I mean, by, by setting these characters, making them actually deaf, you know, it's not like it's not like a theatrical conceit that they're sign language. You know, it's actually part of the story now. And I think the second that people who have any kind of expectation as to what the show is sees what's going on and you know your brain like takes a minute to adjust you're like okay so I'm listening to that person but I'm going to watch the person who's signing and then once everything clicks I think you understand what it is that we're trying to do and I think um, overall the reception has been overwhelmingly positive and that feels very good for all of us I'm sure. Right. What, what was the, the translation process like? Like, how, how did you approach this, or the director, uh, how did you approach this and say, all right, here's this amazingly well put together finalized show, and then kind of, I guess, open up the surface, put the sign language aspect on top of it, and then put it all back together? Because in, in, my, in my opinion, the original choreography had a lot of hand movement, but obviously none of it had to do with signing. But a lot of that original integrity is still maintained in your production, even though the entire show is signed. I, mean, I think I think that um, well, going through the translation process, we, we have we have four genius translators. Um, uh, let's see their names: <laughs> Linda Bove, uh, Shoshana Stern, Anthony Natel, and Elizabeth Green. And they're all they're they're geniuses at what they've done with this script. Um, the all of the scenes and the time period is is 1891, so um, all of that is is almost old signs that were used um, back then, uh, but all oh, of the music is... So like the signing, signing ASL, like, I guess, progresses so if I like... May, uh, yeah, so I can expand on that a little bit. So just like English has changed over time, and it grows and develops, and some words aren't used anymore, and new words come in, same thing with sign language. And so there are different signs that we use uh, I mean, we still do use modern terms throughout, um, but there are some signs that are done differently as an homage to that time. It's the way we produce the sign. I mean, the 1890s um, was a more uptight kind of an area, so we try to reflect that in the language um, and, and sign in a proper manner in what would have been done at that time. Proper, wow, that is something I never thought about. Um, <laughs> I'm the, sorry. The, the original production, though, really made a distinction between the time period being very, the language being very proper in the scenes and the songs themselves sort of like, you know, taking you out of that time to this modern rock musical score. So it was like, that was a, that was a big, I think, distinction in the original show. So the fact that that's being reflected in the sign in this show and, you know, with the band being on stage in this show, 
I think that is one aspect that we've been, you know, we've been able to really, because, you know, the show is totally different. We're doing a completely different thing than we did in the original, but that, that aspect of it, I think, is really being, uh, being maintained in this production, yeah. So how much of, of what is signed actually corresponds to what is being sung? Like, are the lyrics maintained in the, in the sign language? Well, well, no, it is completely different. It is completely the, different. Um, I mean, when it, when it comes yeah, to, the, you... when it comes to the, the words of the music, I mean, as I was saying before, the scenes are all, they're pretty straightforward. The words, they make sense. It's, it's regular communication. But when the songs come about, they're very poetic, and um, uh, it's, it's very, it's almost Shakespearean. Um, you know, you might not understand completely what they're saying just hearing it the first time. You really have to think about it. It really challenges the audience members. Um, and so with our translators, um, the, four, the four translators, they, they did a brilliant job with um, duplicating that essence of, of beauty and poetry, and um, it's, uh, it's still in sign language. But, you know, like, like many languages, the word order is different, you know, so there's you'll be singing a word, but maybe you're not signing that word. Maybe it's it's flipped into a different part of the sentence. Just structurally, I mean, that's a syntactually thing that's not very exciting to talk about. But, um, uh, I mean, the essence, the essence, the essence of, of, um, of, of the songs, of the, of the poetry is still in the sign language. Did you want to, Daniel, did you want to? No, you're doing fine. You said it all. <laughs> You know what, I will say, uh, as an example, uh, there's a line from the song that we did um, that, you know, I'm just going to sign it, but the line that talks about signing and that I would do a new dance, okay, that's the ASL, so it's not exactly what the English is going to be, but this is what it looks like. Sara doing a new dance. So instead of following exactly what the English words are, we go for more of the concepts. And so once people see what the, the signs are and they're hearing the words, even if they don't understand each one right away, it all comes together. And I feel like the ASL adds a whole strong layer that makes it oh so very visual. Hmm. So uh, talking about the... Um I guess the union between actor and, and voice actor, who is also a band member, that, that adds like two extra layers, in my opinion, to what's going on here. Do you, was the rehearsal process or was, was the, the discovery and the creation of the character different than you think than, than it would have been if you had been approaching a character on your own? Well, well, ours is particularly fun because, like I said, I joined the second run, so he had already done all this work, right, on what his idea of this character was. And I, up until a, like a day before we started rehearsals, I had never even met a deaf person. So we had absolutely no means of communication whatsoever. So when Daniel and I met, it started with him, you know, using his phone to type to me, which, I, you know, I, it's all I could, it's the only thing I had to talk to him. And so, you know, through that, we would sit down and we would look at the script. And before we even talked about character choice or what this character's feeling, we would, he would show me all these signs. And, you know, like, I may not be able to be able to know exactly what it is that he's signing in all of our scenes together. But, you know, him and I have worked really, really hard and with the, with the ASL masters to, like, make sure that we understand that when he's on this part of the sequence of sign language that means I have to be on this word and things like that and then and then comes the whole discussion of, of sitting down and Daniel will tell me this is what is going on with this character because it's it's I would say like a 70 30 percent you know c collaboration here like the physical actor needs to be the one taking lead um, and it needs to be our job to, to support what it is they're doing but you know again that doesn't mean there's not input and I'm sure Daniel has plenty to say about this as well. Sure, right. I think that, you know, 
I don't have any musical lines at, at first. We didn't start with that, but he can see the emotion, the energy, and then when it comes to music, he kind of takes the lead. And so I follow his timing and where he is with the rhythm and whatnot. Um, because I can't hear it at all. So we use cues for one another, and right, I take the lead when it's the non-musical part, and then I follow his lead otherwise. And it is a challenge. I mean, I don't have a lot of experience with music, and I need to learn when to go faster, when to go slower. There are different instruments used at different times. So these are things we've worked on together. And you, you actually saw it when we were singing our song together. If you noticed, I was like tapping myself um, just so that he knew when a certain line was starting because you know in the context of the show there's a lot more going on obviously than just the two of us standing there me being able to watch him there are like lights and things like that that will help him and then um yeah what other kind yeah. of cues do the rest of the actors use well the choreography has really worked with how we're moving on the stage there may be a prop that's handed off or or some other uh, movement or action on the stage so that each of us know that, okay, that's my cue and that happens. She takes the paper, then I do this. I will say too that um, I think in this production it's, it's, it's not so much of, and I think it started off this way, but as we all kind of grew together and understood, and even Michael, I think, as, as he started to explore this and understand really what the show was, um, I, I really feel like the, the voice actors aren't just voice actors. I think you guys are your own characters. I see people have thought, you know, equated them to uh, subconscious of the deaf actor or imaginary friends. I see them as guardian angels. And it was even <laughs> a couple weeks ago when um, I have a very intimate scene with Sandra and I didn't realize that Katie was, was making choices and communicating with Sandra. and. Um, I think it's it's really, I wish I could see that because yeah. it's so beautiful. I think that speaks to the creative part of working together because obviously there are technical things like making sure her signs are the same amount of time as my line. So like that's a very technical thing or squeezing her shoulder so that she knows that or, you know, we don't have anything like that. I squeeze his shoulder, but like for her, there are, there are, anytime I touch her, it's a cue. You know, I'm not just touching her arbitrarily to touch her. It's, it's because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to cue her in, within the song. Um, and then, so that's all the technical side of working together. And then creatively, I think this is a really interesting point because I do, we have a relationship on stage, you know. There are things we do to ourselves, you know, in our own lives that I now, as her voice, and sort of her subconscious, her her guardian angel, her, her angel on her right, her her devil on her left, whatever you know. I'm I'm guiding her, um, you know, as sort of a big sister figure, and that, from a creative artistic standpoint, is really cool because I get to embody some of her subconscious thoughts that you know, like as an actor, you have an inner monologue. You know, if you take an acting class, people will say, you know, you're speaking your lines, but what are you saying underneath all of that? And I really get the opportunity to explore those kinds of feelings. Um, and yeah, you'll, if you see the show, you know, there's moments where we connect and it's funny because she's looking to me like, you know, should I go talk to this cute boy? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you should totally go do that. Or, you know, should I have sex with this cute boy? And I'm like, uh, you know, and, <laughs> and you know, what's interesting is what's part of my exciting process has been using, using the lyric as, um, as a way to inform you know this relationship so many of the songs are in a past tense which that's just what the you know the writer gave us and so for me trying to justify why I'm here on this stage you know I really I starting the beginning I really wanted to allow Sandy to create this character for herself and without a lot of like influence from her the voice inside her head I wanted her to have that opportunity so I you know would only really step in in terms of like here's what I think this character would do if we reached a point of like God, what would this character do if we really needed to kind of collaborate on that but m so much of it has been honoring her choices you know allowing her to be free within the moment because there's so so many technical aspects in order for her to feel like I can make new choices every night it's really on me to be focused and following her if she wants to take more time on a certain line you know I, I have to, I can't just do my own thing you know I really have to watch what she's doing um, and going back to the point I made about you know the lyrics being in the past tense for me sort of being outside of it it's really been this experience of a remem uh, you know a, rem a remembrance almost like I I go through the show and I'm I'm almost remembering you know what my former self Ha the choices she's made and and it's you know it has become sort of like a spiritual 
aspect of the show. I think a lot of people come to our show and be like, wow, that was, you know, because so many of the themes are religious and spiritual and about how the, the church has caused so many people to feel so ashamed, you know, of, of their human desires. And um, so I think having these voicing characters has really brought, you know, amplified that, that spiritual element of the show, at least for me. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I want to do another awkward transition here and pull out our N plus two redundancy. Um, I found another mic, which I think belong in the aisles here. Yeah. There we go. All right. Pay no attention to the man in the corner. Um, so yes, if you have uh, any questions for the cast, please come up to the mics here once they're both on the stands and uh, you can talk to them. Um, Austin, this is not only your Broadway debut, but apparently your theatrical debut. Like, where'd you come from, dude? <laughs> Um, it's also uh, Miles, Miles Barbie, who plays uh, Otto, his as well, right over there. Um, uh, him and I, um, we, uh, uh, well, I don't know, I, I connect with him through fear because this is such a scary thing to do. <laughs> well, um, what'd you do beforehand? You did like TV film, right? Like, or, no. or are you just like, hey, I'm gonna sit in an audition table, I'm on Broadway. Pretty much. <laughs> well, I, I blinked an eye and here I was. Um, no, I, um, I was uh, attending college to become a special needs teacher, and um, and then I mean truly all this just happened, and I, I woke up, and I'm not sure if this is some sort of nightmare, or some sort of dream come <laughs> true, um, uh, but you know it's it's nice to to have the consistent show to go to every night, and I have a family to go to every night, and and um, yeah, I love so that. Welcome that, to New York. Well, thank you. Know. Yeah, you've got the uh, the Jonathan Groff embodiment going on there. Have you been you've been told that before? You got the hair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I guess speaking of original cast members, you were on uh, the Glee project, Ali, and um, then you got your role on Glee for a few episodes, right? Did you did were you working on this at all during that time? Like, did you talk with this with Leah Michelle at all? Yeah, it's very odd, right? Um, really? No, no. Um, oh. <laughs> I was not involved with this at all. Um, I saw Leah do the show yeah. um, on Broadway when I was in college, and I had some friends that were in the original production. And I never thought I'd be a part of Spring Awakening um, because I'm I'm 28, and these characters are 14. So, <laughs> okay. Um, but, um, but there I was on Glee playing 16. So, um, yeah, so... No, there were they. They were not connected, but it's kind of hmm. interesting. Yeah, it's very coincidence. ironic. And you're also the first person in a wheelchair to ever be on Broadway as well. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. So yes, lots, lots of firsts here. Um, but I want to go back to to I guess the kind of what do we call it? People swapping. Whenever there are understudies in, that's why Robert. That's where you come in, right? So he how just, many people do you just, understudy? Uh, he just went in for our haunchin. Uh, a couple of nights ago, and he was brilliant. He oh, was yeah? genius. And so he should. Uh, um, <laughs> and so how many characters do you understudy? I cover four different roles. Um, <laughs> I have also never signed before I started this production. And all of the characters that I cover sign the, entire, <laughs> the entirety of the show. It's, so. a pretty, it's an easy job. Easy <laughs> job. <laughs> I've also never swung before. I've been an understudy before, you know, for like one character in a show or something. But, you know, swinging for several different roles is definitely its own challenge. And I feel like I was very lucky enough to come to this. Uh, I feel like I came to this point in my life very prepared for this job because I have done two different productions of Spring Awakening prior to this. And actually, right before I got my audition for this job, I had just closed a production of Spring Awakening Upstate where I was playing Melchior. So it was fresh in my mind, and you know I was like ready to audition. And then they called me back, and they had me do an ASL work session. And it was you know, two hours of intense, like, OK, you're going to learn a scene and a song for your final callback, and then kind of prove to us that you can learn ASL fast enough. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's been, and it's really hard because you know, um, like they were mentioning before, a lot of this cast has been together already for a year and developing the show and everything. And uh, the swings, uh, I think almost yeah, all of us are new. Um, we're we had to kind of learn it just from watching them in rehearsal. We didn't really get any special attention until after opening. 
So our first rehearsal was the Tuesday after we clo after we opened on Broadway. And it's like a week and a half ago. Yeah. And yeah. so I had <laughs> I had really only one like actual rehearsal for Hanshin before I went on because I went on Monday night. And it was the <laughs> I had never been so under rehearsed for a, a performance ever in my entire life. And I've I've been in performing for 11 years now. Um, <laughs> But the support that I got from the cast and everyone backstage, the crew, like they, everyone was watching out for me. You know, whenever I was like just a little bit off, I would get like a little shove from someone to make sure I was in the, the right spot. You know, it was like very, very shove with love. And, um, and every time I came, came off stage, people were like, okay, how, how are you feeling? How's it going? And I was like, good, good. You know, like uh, it was just the craziest night. Um, you also had a hundred people in the audience to see you, which was amazing. So we I'm had, from like, New York. Incredible I'm from Queens, cast. And be being from New York, I have, you know, I've lived here all of my life and I have a lot of uh, my family and friends are all here basically. And so uh, I knew that I had the date on Monday was going to be my first night on um, from from the day I got the job. And so I told people right away, I was like, God, I'll get your tickets for October 5th. That's like my Broadway debut, you know, <laughs> and word got around and I I had about 150 people there to see me. Um, it was the wildest night of my life. <laughs> Looks like we got a question over here. Hi, I just recently saw the show. It was great. I was curious if you could explain the beginning. We were all in your undergarments and the significance of that. I'm c I'm clothed. I don't I don't I do think it. That's true. Yeah. I think it's basically Michael wanted it to be sort of like n not an not he didn't want there to be a time period to be clear on stage and at the end of the show everyone also takes their undergarments off so it's really this time where we come on stage as ourselves and we leave as ourselves and um without you take your clothes off back to undergarments <laughs> right so yeah in the slow. last song in the last naked. song <laughs> right 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 Go we don't get naked show. or anything <laughs> we're not like nude on stage this is that's a different musical um, but uh, but no, I mean we we all have you know I, everyone except for the musicians, which I think is a cool picture at the end too. You know we're we're in modern clothing. Musicians are all in modern clothing the whole time. Um, but the undergarments I think serve as sort of just a a wiping away of the of time. You know it's not about it being set in that time. It's these themes are relevant today. You know parents and children still have trouble communicating. You know. That's why there's this big outrage about you know Planned Parenthood. Like people need other places to go to get this information because parents sometimes don't know how to talk to their kids, and um, so I think that just really sort of serves as a yeah. I would a, love to add device. something yeah. too. Um, this show is really an ensemble piece. We work together so closely, um, not just like the technical sides of the signing, but like you know we have to all be together and. Um, and so that is sort of a moment before the show starts where we're all on stage together and we can kind of connect like, okay, here we go team. Let's tell the story. Let's like connect with each other before we, before we do this. So I think it also serves as, as a moment for all of us. Right, and then you know when Sandy and I come to the mirror, she hands me my guitar and I hand her her, her dress, her period dress. And so um, I think that really serves as a technique to just show, illustrate how the show's going to work. Um, you know, she gives me the you know permission to be her voice, and I give her permission to to go forth and to tell the story, and that ends up you know setting the stage without having to like have someone explain. That kind of does it does it for mm -hmm. for that. So you guys are all on stage as the house is open, like the audience is loading in, right? It is. How much of that is choreographed and scripted? You guys actually just up there having fun and being yourselves? We're just playing. Yeah. We're just having fun with each other, warming up together. Yeah, it's our it's really been a great thing because it helps us to relax. It helps us to, you know, know we're coming together, we're working together. And I don't know about other people, but for me it was like, okay, I'm ready. Here we are, I'm putting on this character. And so no, nothing of it is planned out. We just it's our playing ground before the uh, show starts. It also makes you a little less scared because, you know, that nightmare where you're in front of the class with just your underwear. In your underwear, on. yeah. <laughs> well, we did it. So <laughs> every night it, have you ever had like any weird happening where you had to hold the house and you're sitting there on stage for like 10 minutes saying, why can't I put my clothes on yet? Opening night. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I'm, I mean, a lot of people who were very fancy had to arrive. <laughs> so like, we, we knew, it, I mean, we knew that that was gonna 
kind of be the deal. But, you know, you're just standing there like, I don't know, you're like waiting to, you're trying to be, because in the show and not be too excited because it's opening night and stuff but then you're like ah there's Kelly Ripa hello like and you just like people are getting dressed and then we're standing there like trying to yeah but it hasn't been, hasn't been that bad we, I mean it's been, like yeah. it's t-shirts and boxers and slips for girls so right. old old timey underwear is more conservative right. than <laughs> modern underwear which um, is nothing I want to go back to the, the yes. yes I want to go back to the, the underlying message of the show for a second um because it, it's in the show that you deal with um, with suicide and with teenage pregnancy and abortion and all of and just overall general f- topics that now are still somewhat taboo, unfortunately. Like, have you had anyone reach out to you through the show, maybe that has voiced voice support through you or, or looked for support from you? Well, yeah. Um One of the favorite parts that I've experienced is afterwards going out to meet the fans and sign the autographs and talk to people. And there have been people who've approached me and talked about their own personal experiences. And it's just fantastic to see the variations amongst our fans, but the common threads and the similarities, you know, the experience of coming through a dark time and depression and you know, for people to be able to see that on stage, that has been inspiring to me to honor that and hope that we're reflecting that in an honorable way. But yeah, it has been to me to meet the fans and the various emotions that this generates, people who have experienced loss. It's pretty, it's pretty human experience. And I would also add that um, we've gotten letters or people on Twitter or Tumblr and even some personal direct emails. Um, There was one story that um, a woman sent about having grown up hearing and having become deaf and having to try and learn sign language and she hadn't really gotten into it. But by virtue of seeing the show, she felt like there may have been an opening in our community and that she felt motivated to go out there and learn sign language. She's deaf and there's lots of lots of people out there who lose their hearing but they try to get through just with reading lips and and without learning sign language and they never are comfortable. They never have 100% access. And so for us to kind of represent that experience, that was kind of heart-wrenching for me. That was touching. Hmm. And I'd just like to add one other thing. Um, I've had some really cool conversations with people in um, the disabled or differently abled community about how rarely the two topics of sexuality and disability are put together. Right. And um, that this is a really unique opportunity to be able to share that story mm-hmm. um, when you add this other element onto it. Right. Yes, yeah. I, well, Go ahead. So I just add, I, um, I, I think the biggest thing is, um, I mean, so many people come into this show, I think, ignorant to to this culture that's that's alive and well and 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 beautiful and you know I don't think that it's a tragedy to be ignorant to something I think the real tragedy is when you continue to be ignorant you choose to be ignorant to something and I think that for people who have seen the show who um you know are are deaf or you know it really doesn't matter I mean for for any audience member in the show I think seeing this production this way it's putting forth the idea that there is a place for everyone regardless of anything that has to do with your your physical challenges. Everyone has everyone has something, and there's a place for every single person. Right. Well, the closing number that you guys performed here for us, "Purple Summer." So, "Purple Summer" is a it's a flower that only blooms in summer, right? I think that's what it's supposed to be metaphorical, or is it a it's literal beautiful. thing? It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's this this flower it's only blooms in summer, which I guess which I took to interpret. This is me reading into it, which I took to interpret um, as that the spring, everything is just blossoming, everything is growing, but everything is pretty much time boxed so if things are bad that basically this too shall pass like it will get better things time moves on time heals all wounds and I I think that's one thing and through every iteration of this show that I've done before and I've I was a huge fan of the original when it came out Mm -hmm. and you know it it was it came out at a time where I was going through a lot of things that like the show just kind of shed light on things that worse it it just helped me through it was like the soundtrack of my life at the time Mm -hmm. and um one thing that's always been consistent one message that's always been consistent is that as tragic as the story is when you get to purple summer it's that message of hope you have to leave the audience with that message of hope that there is more Mm -hmm. you know that there there is a light at the end of all of this and um you know purple summer is not meant to be a, a, an ending to the story it's a coda in the script it's written as a coda it's not even like the story ends at the end of melchior's last right. song those you've known and then the actors come out and tell you what the message is of 
why we told you this. Right. You uh, you need to to experience winter to get to summer. Good point. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if there are no more questions, then uh, then we are out of time here. So please help me uh, in thanking them for coming in. Thank you so much.